Okay, welcome back. Uh, this is the last part of our discussion about composition and page structure. When we last left off, we were talking about uh, large triangles and use of uh, strong diagonals in composition, the difference between this type of triangular composition versus uh, classic uh, Renaissance type triangle. And so that leads to talking about sort of the flip side of this, which would be thinking about the way some artists, certain kinds of paintings and compositions use these very the similar um, ideas of page structure for almost exactly opposite effects. Um, in terms of instead of placing things in locations that are consonant and that are, have a sense of comfortableness, um, instead artists who, um, and Francis Bacon I think is a fantastic example of this, who um, in a lot of different kinds of choices, but in, especially in terms of compositional choices, is looking for locations and placements that are near um, to locations of constant, but but close and kind of like naggingly, annoyingly close. So aiming for tension and awkwardness instead of consonants and harmony and balance. Um, I think this painting has, or this series of paintings has all kinds of tensions built into them. Some of them have to do with the imagery, obviously, and some of them have to do with um, with the paint and the paint handling, the the contrast between really flat textures versus very kind of um, painterly sections. Um, but also, it has to do with the placement of things, awkward positions, the things to edges, um, and a lot to do with location. You know, the placement on the page. Um, if we looked at some works that may be a little less challenging, a little less um, tense and awkward, um, but both of these paintings are, in a much more modern, you know, 20th century kind of way, are thinking about composition, but in ways that kind of both uses those structures, but also pushes against them and plays against them. Um, once again, I think the bacon is the more tense, and awkward um, between the two, using awkward purposefully. Um, but in both of them, there is a sense of um, there being a balance between consonants and dissonance, and a kind of balance that's much more on the dissonant side than what we would have seen in other types of paintings. Hold on. Next slide is there we go. Um, which leads to talking about this uh, drawing. We have talked about this drawing by Degas many times, and we've talked about it for a lot of different reasons. We talked about it right at the beginning of the class because we were talking about pastel drawing, and we've talked about it in terms of hierarchy. We've talked about it in terms of use of scale, change of scale and proportion. Um, later we'll be talking about it in terms of space, the way it makes space from these close objects to there. Um, but one of the reasons why I think I keep returning to it and why I use it so many times in the class is just because the composition itself is so interesting. And I think one of the reasons why it's interesting is that it both feels very composed in that kind of like um, asymmetrical, super balanced way that um, some of the paintings of Mondrian feel composed or in the way that um, a Vermeer feels composed. It feels both very calmly, almost classically composed, and yet at the same time it feels kind of slightly awkward and has this kind of like impromptu cropping as if it was just like a snapshot. Um, and part of that may have been in part because uh, Degas worked from photographs, and and a part of it may be because of like this kind of this cropping of this table plane and the way that already cuts into and plays with whether the composition is really kind of a square composition or a rectangle composition. But there's another reason why I think it has this kind of an unusual sense of balance and that has to do with its structure. And I think that when you really start examining its structure and how it plays off of like the corner to corner diagonals and the divisions of halves and, and quarters as well as thirds, although I haven't put the thirds in there. Um, one of the things that you start to notice is that it really is built around this sort of like a kind of a playful idea around um, kind of the golden mean and sort of a golden mean spiral. It is not, by the way, um, when I say that I don't mean that the um, actual proportion of this outside rectangle match the golden mean because they don't. Like if you divided this into a 
a square right there, this remaining rectangle would be a little bit too long going in this direction to be, right? But that said, it still has that same, I mean, if you look at it, everything seems to be playing around this kind of meandering spiral and, this, and lots of spirals within spirals of like areas that get in, broken up into smaller and smaller divisions. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it has such an interesting and kind of unusual feeling of both being structural and, and, a, and playing off of structure simultaneously. I wanted to also talk about this piece. We've seen this piece before, um, this painting by Joan Mitchell. And I like, I'm using it here because I feel like, we, even though we've seen this before, I think in terms of first impression students, when they look at this, they think just in terms of like all the stuff going on, the chaos of it. Um, but it really isn't a, um, a particularly chaotic image. And one of the reasons why it's not a chaotic image is because that underlying a lot of these destruct or, um, a lot of these um, structures is um, kind of groupings and implied lines and these implied lines seem to be referring to kind of the structure of the page you can definitely feel like she was thinking about this diagonal and this horizontal um, and so yeah I think that, that definitely makes it feel a much more composed and organized kind of composition um, this is the last image of the slide, but I just wanted to, as a kind of funny way to end, to show how it's always, the use of page structure is always part of uh, decision making. This is an Andy Leibowitz uh, photograph for Vanity Fair, one of a thousand Andy Leibowitz Vanity Fair, um, not that she's done a thousand, but she's done a lot of these kind of things, and we're grouping figures, and she's always thinking very much around structure, um, and so... Uh, just kind of shows you how it's you know that kind of thinking is there in uh, in art making even today all the time it's always there all right um, this ends the lecture for now and the next set will be about the transition out of the Baroque into the Rococo um, and into uh, enlightenment kind of period of enlightenment as well as into um, the uh, neoclassical period okay thanks <laughs>